Yeah, this is a spin room without actually much spin going on at the moment. So this was the second head-to-head -head debate. It's not the debate that we thought we'd be having. It all started off very typically. You know, we're used to these debates now, the back and forth, the introductions. But about half an hour in, it all came to a very abrupt and rather dramatic end. Liz Truss was midway through an answer. All of a sudden, you see her face fall, very, very shocked, and then the broadcast fell off air. Now, there were, lots of, there were some rumors about what was going on during that time. We've actually had an update in the last couple of minutes now from Talk TV. They say Kate McCann, that's the political editor of, of Talk TV who was hosting the debate, Kate McCann fainted on air tonight, and although she is fine, the medical advice was that we shouldn't continue with the debate. We apologize to our viewers and listeners. Now, look, as you said there, Chris, the most important thing here is that it sounds like Kate's fine. It sounds like there was no security issue or anything there. So, you know, this isn't the debate that we wanted to have, wasn't the debate that we thought would happen, but everyone appears to be fine. However, before all of that happened, we did actually have about half an hour of the debate. So there is a lot that we can actually unpick from that. A lot was said. First of all, all ears tonight weren't just listening out for what was said, but how it was being said. It was really noticeable in last night's debate in Stoke-on-Trent that there was a viciousness between Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak that was significantly, significantly toned down this evening. It was far less of a, the two candidates slagging each other off. There wasn't, there wasn't any of the... Uh, the tone was completely different from, from last night. It was less aggressive. There was less talking over each other. But there was still a bit of that this evening. Rishi Sunak last night was accused of mansplaining, uh, describing going through Liz Truss's answers and explaining them in a bit too much detail. And there I've just mansplained what mansplaining is. Um, but look, the, the tone was very different tonight to how it was this evening. I was talking to Conservative MPs last night after the debate. I texted one who isn't in either of the camps. And I said, look, after tonight's debate, who do you think came out best? They said, Labour. Tonight's was very different. The tone of it was very different and it was much more on policies, not just tax. The very first question to the candidates was about the NHS. It was noticeable last night. There were no questions on the NHS. The second question was on the cost of living crisis and about how people are able to afford food. This is a flavour of how the first half an hour of the debate went along tonight. Well, you know what? I was uh, going to ask Liz how she was spending her birthday, because for everyone watching, it's Liz's birthday today. So happy birthday, Liz. Thank and you. Not the, I'm sure not the, the best way to spend it. And there's a plan that I've published that says that from day one, tackling this backlog will be my number one public service priority. I'm confident that we can get the, the wait list down quicker. People like John will get the treatment that they need quicker. But we're not going to be able to do any of that if the NHS doesn't have the security okay, of the I funding it that needs, and Liz that's Trust, something as Chancellor that I put in place. Point there, Liz Trust. Where will extra money come from for the NHS? So I am committed to the extra money that was announced for the NHS. It is needed to deal with the backlog, and I would fund that money out of general taxation. Under my plans, we will still be able to start paying the debt down within three years. So it is affordable. And the fact is, whatever Rishi says now, we did not need to raise national insurance in order to pay. We did have that money available in the budget. It was a choice to break our manifesto commitment and raise national insurance. I think it was the wrong choice to make. I spoke out against it at the time in Cabinet. I still remain opposed to it, and I will reverse that rise. I do think it is morally wrong at these, this moment when families are struggling to pay for their food, that we have put up taxes on ordinary people when we said we wouldn't in our manifesto and when we didn't need to do Richard so. Richard Sunak, is that this morally is a... wrong? I think what's morally wrong is asking our children and grandchildren to pick up the tab for the it's bills that true. we're not prepared to meet. So, one and a bit debates in. How are the two candidates faring? Yeah, well, this is normally the bit. Well, I would be telling you how their camps see how they're faring. We're in the spin room. There's no spin going on in the spin room at the moment because both camps have decided that, given what happened, they didn't feel it was appropriate to start briefing out against the other candidates, which is fair enough. We were also meant to have um, guests. We were also meant to have MPs, backers of the two candidates here this evening. They've decided they won't do that tonight out of respect. So normally... 
they would go through, picking apart everyone's answers and tell you how they think they fare. We haven't got that tonight. What we have got is a YouGov poll from this afternoon based on how last night's debate went. And from that, it says that Conservative members believed that Liz Truss outperformed Rishi Sunak. In fact, they thought that they gave her 50% and they gave Rishi Sunak 39%. Now, this is a bit of a kick in the teeth, really, uh, for Rishi Sunak's camp. The, the theory was that Liz Truss was po more popular with members, but Rishi Sunak's camp were briefing out that, look, he's the guy who can handle debates really well. Well, he's had his first debate now. Part of the reason it's seen that why he was doing so much talking over Liz Truss yesterday was that he really had to come out of the traps hard. And he did that. He did that well. But, you know, look at his numbers. He's only at 39%. Before tonight's debate, there was a bit of spinning going on before the unfortunate events of, of this evening. And Rishi Sunak's camp have told me, no, 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 don't worry, this is actually good news. There was a poll last week, too, and Rishi Sunak was eight points below. He's gained eight points. So this is all good, this is all good stuff for him. He can carry on going. What we have now is, well, we've got more debates, we've got more hustings all over the all over the summer. The next debate will be on Thursday night. It's in Leeds. We'll be there. Hopefully we'll get a bit more of it. Hopefully there'll be a bit more spinning afterwards. And uh, you can hear all the latest on that on Thursday night. Thanks, Paul. Now, levelling up wasn't mentioned much in that debate or in the contest generally to be the next Prime Minister. So to discuss why, I'm joined by Richard Duggan, who's the regional editor for Lancashire and Greater Manchester at NewsQuest, which owns local newspapers across the UK. Richard, thank you so much for joining us. You've devoted all these front pages. Do you think it's not being mentioned enough by uh, the candidates at the moment? Well, if I'm honest, I think Liz Truss's earring has got more of a mention last night than the levelling of North agenda policy that's meant to be a flagship of the Conservative government. And that kind of tells tells a wider story, really, about how a lot of people in the north of England feel. You know, there's there's been a north-south divide for a long time. And what we're asking for is newspaper editors who represent our readers in the north to say, you know, we need to bridge this substantial gap that exists. And the figures released today show that that, that gap isn't made up. It's very, very real. And, you know, the, one of the issues that I'm particularly concerned about for my region is the staggering levels of child poverty that we have in the northwest. And we'll get on to that in a second. You're talking there and it sounds like there's real anger from you. And do you think your readers as well about this issue and it not being addressed? Yeah, I think the term levelling up continues to be a soundbite. When I speak to readers, colleagues, friends, family, it's generally people don't really know what levelling up is. They know it's government policy, but they're not quite sure what it actually means for them, particularly in the north of England. And what I will try and explain to them is that, you know, it's not about levelling down the south, but it's about trying to, you know, set, you know, sort out the inequality that has existed between the two areas for years. You know, we're not, it's not about us going cap in hand to Westminster and saying, actually, you know, please give us some money. It's a case going, please fundly fair our region, help us grow economically. And that's why as newspapers across the region, I believe there are 15 of us, we ask the uh, future prime minister, whoever it may be, Rishi Sunak or Liz Truss, five questions. You know, what are they going to do to keep their commitments that have been made by their predecessor? What are they going to do about the fact mm. that uh, the average worker in the North is 50% less productive than one in London? What are they going to do about whether they're going to give any northern leaders control over budgets, transport, health? Are they going to retain a government department responsible for tackling regional inequalities? Will that person be a cabinet? Will that person have, you know, will that role have a cabinet level minister? What are they going to do to address the spiraling rates of child poverty in parts of northern England? And these are questions that the candidates, frankly, are not answering. We mentioned a little bit earlier the think tank and they had all of the um, issues that they were talking about. And you were talking about child poverty in particular. What are you hearing about child poverty in the area? Well, I've got some really startling figures, which I was aware of. I sort of deep dived into them before coming on the show. And it's absolutely heart wrenching the number of people in in the northwest and particularly in Lancashire, you know, what they're going through. You know, we have more than 22,000 families in Blackburn and Darwin who had to receive the recent cost of living crisis payment. Um, almost a quarter of children in Blackburn have to get free school meals. We've got two, you know, we've got Blackburn and Blackpool and Blackburn who all are bearing the brunt of soaring costs as a result of inflation, 
poorly insulated houses. You know, there's there's a lot of debate and vitriol online about heating or eating, whether it's a real thing. And from what my readers are telling me, what I'm saying, that is a real thing. People are really worried. So you have the lack of levelling up, which is meant to be a flagship policy, combined with a cost of living crisis, which people are at crisis point. You know, Old and Western Royston constituency has the highest, 13th highest child poverty rate in the UK, which is just awful. We're one of the most developed countries in the world. Mm. We should not have this level of poverty. In fact, we shouldn't have any poverty at all. Richard Duggan, thank you very much for joining us and going through those figures.